this is the first day of the Community Fast of Compassion, and it will run through next Saturday. Why should we even care? This is the ninth year that we've done this, and each year the gifts given have gone to help many, many people. The gifts go to the PT, P, PS, the parent, teacher, students, associations in the school to help kids that have needs, whatever they might be for clothing or whatever. Uh, we trust the schools to know those people and distribute those funds by their need. The funds also go to all the helping agencies on the mountain, including Salvation Army, CCO, St. Vincent de Paul, to help the people in a better or more profound way with the funds they receive. And to the service organizations like the VFW, the Elks, um, all of these organizations receive funding from this FAST because we trust the people who lead these organizations to know who have the needs and how to distribute those funds. So your gifts go to a good cause and you can trust that they reach the people who need to be reached. Fasting has a long biblical history. The first and foremost who fasted was Jesus. And you remember how the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness after he was baptized to be tempted by the devil. And the text says he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. That is an accomplishment. I know some of us have barely been able to fast for a couple of days without experiencing the stress and tension of being hungry. But you see, Jesus needed to go through that because he was going to be tested at his weakest moment, and he had to put his full trust in the Father. We need to understand that in this fast. When Jesus was depleted to that point where he was hungry, he had to put his full trust in the Father when the evil one came against him. In another place, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. It's that complete giving over to the Father that's the lesson for us. Jesus was totally obedient. Jesus was totally in the will of God. And you remember even when he was in the garden, he said, Lord, our Father, if, if this cup can pass from me, let it be. Nevertheless, thy will be done. When, when we remove ourselves from the flesh and, and the demands of the flesh, and we begin to trust in God, then we take on that same spirit. Not my will, but thine be done. There's a classic scripture about this that I'd like to read to you. It's from the 17th chapter of Matthew. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus and falling on his knees before him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and off into the water. Brought him, I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, and listen to these words carefully, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and they said, why couldn't we cast it out? And he said to them, because of your littleness of faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. 
But this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. I remember when I was first taught that passage as a boy in Sunday school, I thought this kind referred to the demon, but it doesn't. This whole passage is about faith. And what is the enemy of faith? Unbelief. Doubt. We've been preaching on faith for about four weeks. You've heard several of us stand up and proclaim the faith that we have in Jesus Christ and how important this is for our life and well-being. And here Jesus is giving a lesson to his disciples. He's saying, because of the littleness of your faith. It's not the demon, that's not the issue. The issue is that this kind, which is unbelief, lack of faith, only comes out by prayer and fasting. And you'll notice in this passage also that Jesus just cast it out. Jesus didn't pray and he didn't fast. But our Lord cast it out because his union with the Father and the perfect will of God is in harmony. But we aren't that way. So we're troubled by our flesh and by the things that happen around us. So we need to enter into some mechanism to help us get connected. And prayer and fasting is that mechanism. If you pray and fast, you are humbling yourself, separating your ego, and increasing your belief and trust in God and Him alone. That's hard for us. It's especially hard for us white male Americans. I don't know about you men, but my dad was pretty tough. He was not a believer, and he said, basically, if you're going to get any help, it's going to be from you. Don't expect other people to help you. And for my dad, that meant God also. And so we get into this frame of thinking where we're responsible. We have to do it. We have to claim it. We have to make the effort. You may say to me, well, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it, but the point is, if we're going to live the life of faith, sooner or later, we got to turn to Him. That's where the power is. That's where the majesty is. God is our Heavenly Father. And so, we lay down our food to try and separate ourselves away from the flesh and the fleshy desires. And we instead pray during that time that we would have eaten. And we pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we pray for ourselves and the rest of the prayer, give us this day our daily bread. But you see, the essence of prayer, the essence of our life as believers, is for Him. Your will be done. Your righteousness prevail. Your goodness be upon the earth. You are, in short, paying more attention to God's business than your own. Now all of this is by way of saying that our prayers are often ineffectual because we haven't taken the time or made the effort to get connected to God. This is the way the Apostle James puts it. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your self. You adulteress, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Wait a minute. Friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Aren't I supposed to be friendly? Doesn't the Bible say, prove yourself friendly? 
Of course. We're to develop relationships that have friendship and love in them. But friendship with the world means that I think more about my house, my car, my job, my health, and how I look than I think about God. The Christian life has always been about turning ourselves over to God. And that's an adventure. And some of you right here in this congregation right now are learning to do that. And it's difficult and often painful to turn ourselves over for God. We can't value the things of the world more than our relationship with God. It's easy for us to say, my priorities are God first, then my family, then my church. It's easy to say that, but putting God's first is a whole different category in terms of our life. How do I put God first when I go shopping at the market? How do I put God's first when I go to the polling booth? How do I put God first when I'm on the highway and I pass somebody who is broken down or has a flat tire or has a need? You see, Jesus by his very life is giving us a testimony to what it means to be a Christian to care about what really matters. And if you want to find a way into that, fast and pray. Mahatma Gandhi, the famous Indian nonviolent protester against British rule, was fasting as a device to bring about political change. He fasted in 1932 to protest an unfair voting scheme. He fasted in 1943 while in prison for breaking colonial law. He fasted again in 1948 to protest British rule in India. When Gandhi fasted, it was a death fast. The fasting that Jesus practiced was not for political advantage or to sway people. Jesus fasted to overcome the flesh and the world's grip on his will. The prophet Isaiah has some powerful words about fasting. Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressor go free, oppressed go free? and break every yoke, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you then the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here am I. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. That was written 400 years before the Lord Jesus walked the earth. God has been speaking this message to us from the very beginning. What is the fast that God prefers? That you fast in your heart and cast away the things of the world and the wickedness that you might give him full attention what one among us who, was, who is married would not at, at a point realize we need to give our mate full attention? 
When, when our attention is distracted and it goes other directions, it causes great havoc and problem in the relationship. And it's the same with God. Does God have our attention? <laughs> Does he have our love? Isn't that what Jesus said, the two great commandments? The first is to love God, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the fast that God demands. We're not fasting for a political uh, expression. We're not fasting because we're trying to persuade somebody or people. We're fasting because we're learning to live in the light of God and not in the light of the world. And in that fast, in this particular case, with what we're doing right here in the White Mountains, that fast is having a ripple effect, sending out resources to hundreds of people that need help. Isn't that what Isaiah said? Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to divide your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless into your house? God looks on the heart. Solomon, in one of his Proverbs, warns us, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. What's your heart condition right now? You say, well, I got a little tachycardia. <laughs> what is your heart condition? You see, for the Hebrew, everything proceeded from the heart. We learned from the heart. We had emotions from the heart. For the Greeks, who seemed to be our progenitors, it was all from the head, the way you think. But for the Hebrew, it's from the heart, and that's what the Bible teaches. With the heart, man proceeds and does what is right before God. We're fasting because we want God's favor, and we want to do something for others, and because it is our hearts that are being changed. This then is what God says to the prophet. Stop continuing in contention and strife while you fast. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? Second, is fasting really putting on sackcloth and ashes, covering yourself in, in a mournful situation? No, it's being alive and vital, freed. To care about God. Thirdly, rather the fast which I choose is to loose the bonds of wickedness and let the oppressed go free. What's the problem with the human race? It's sin. It always has been. That's what the Bible tells us. What is the solution to sin? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. <clears throat> is it starting to make sense? I mean, think about all of the counsel you've had in your life and all of the contact with the psychological community, and all of the contact with whoever offers another solution, another book, another way to solve your problem, and all this is meaningless because it comes back to one thing, what God says here. Paul said, it is a true statement that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, but he doesn't stop there. He says, and I am the greatest sinner of all. You see, that's what we're saying. We're fasting and we're recognizing that God is working with us to transform us. Fasting was seen by the Jew and the first century Christian as a time of mourning. King David fasted when he appealed to God for his infant son by Bathsheba, and he was mourning his own sin and the illness of his son. And when the infant died, David said to those around him, <clears throat> while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? We're fasting in the time that we have. 
I don't know if these times are any more troubling than they were in the past. I think of our national history, let alone world history. <clears throat> we had some pretty troubling times. Civil War was one of them. World War II was another one. Vietnam was another one. <clears throat> but maybe if, if we pray and fast, we can break the bond, this earth, and connect with God. And then when we pray, O oh Lord God, be merciful to us. Deliver us from the wickedness of this day. Teach our leaders to come to you. Bring about salvation across this nation. Then maybe it will have a greater power. You see, it's, it's never been the solution to say if we just had this guy in office, it would make a difference. That's never been the solution. The solution is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Jesus said much the same thing to his disciples. The Pharisees asked Jesus why his disciples did not fast like those of John the Baptist or their own disciples. And Jesus answered, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? The bridegroom is Jesus. The disciples had the joy of Jesus when he was with them, but when he was taken away, they mourned. Jesus knew the Old Testament. He knew the Pharisees, and he knew that they fasted and mourning for the transgressions of the people of Israel. But God has given us a new vision. It's the vision of the fasting of our hearts that the giving away of ourselves to others brings liberty. Not to mourn. And put on a gloomy face as Jesus criticizes the Jewish leaders but to rejoice in laying aside our own hungers for the well-being of others. Nothing shows us the Christian view of self-giving love and others as does fasting. We must face the awesome fact that most Americans, most of us, are wealthy way beyond what the rest of the world has experienced. When we fast, we are immediately reminded of our physical deprivation and what it feels like to be hungry. And that should remind us again of the one who has provided the food to eat. We begin to feel the pain of others, and not necessarily hunger pain, but the pain of struggling through life without the blessings that most of us have. One of our people uh, live on the outskirts of the mountain community, and uh, they've had to depend upon rural resources like solar energy, etc. And she told me the other day, we finally have a light in our bathroom. And I thought, well, I've always had a light in my bathroom. What, what's so great about having a light in the bathroom? That's the way we are. Our expectations have overtaken our heart knowledge. It's time to Look to the Lord and pray. And we pray that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that he'll complete the age and come again. Maranatha, O Lord, come. We pray that he'll come, be with us in, in power and majesty, that he'll work signs and wonders. We pray for the poor and for the downtrodden and the alien and those who are suffering among us. We pray for justice and mercy and peace. That's what we're fasting about. To make it simple, think about it this way. You're sitting at your dining room table and you have shared a meal with your family. You're still hungry <clears throat> and there is one piece of chicken left. You're wanting it. And then you look at one of your children. You sense that he wants it too, maybe even needs it. So you deny yourself and give it to him. That's what fasting is about. Thank you, O oh Lord God, 
for giving us these wonderful directions that we might have life and have it abundantly in you. May you be blessed in this place and in our lives, and may you take the glory, all of it, and may your majesty be displayed to all the earth. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.